majority section. And at first couple weeks after the election, there's talk of secession, things seem to calm down, and then they begin to pick up in South Carolina. We're gonna jump right to this, secession. South Carolina, a month and a half would see. Now you've read these documents, you read about this, but I'm gonna put in a couple more, fill in a couple more blanks. These are gonna get out of here, man. Let's go. And secession is sort of pushing and pushing. But this was a very, very hard issue. Everybody knew in South Carolina, regardless if you wanted secession or not, secession meant civil war. So put that somewhere. That equals civil war. There's no way to quibble about the terms about this. It's not like we secede that we get together and talk. No, everybody knows it. So those who want secession, this is an aggressive move by them, an offensive move, a strike. Because the country cannot survive if the state can leave the union. Because if the United States allows one state to leave, that means that federal law become essentially worthless. And the federal umbrella of states will begin to break apart and they will collapse. So secession equals civil war. That is why they called this war during the fight, the Civil War or the War of Rebellion. Those were the two names. The war between the states would start being used about 25, 30 years after the war. They did not call it that during the war. So, everybody knew. But then, some of the secession had started spreading a rumor that South Carolina, yes. Sorry, he needs his back. That's it? Perfect. All right, South Carolina. South Carolina, they started spreading a rumor that Georgia was going to secede first. And they're like, we can't have Georgia beat us until they secede. That was a lie. Georgia wasn't going to secede. But then once Georgia or once South Carolina seceded, what did the rest of the states do? Ah, but here are the reasons they gave, and they're all reasons we talked about. So these are nothing new. But remember going back to the Missouri Compromise. The South was fearful there'll be now a congressional minority. And that whole thing about diffusion and spreading out to defend slavery, we're gonna be the minority section. And it's not, they knew, they knew that Abraham Lincoln was not also gonna pass a law like a president could do that and get rid of slavery. It's what might happen 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road. That's what they're scared of. I repeat, it's not anything that the Republicans were going to do, at least what Republicans said they could do, or the Republicans could pass in Congress. It's what they might do. Same thing here. With a free soil president who, as everyone knows, a free soiler is the equivalent of John Brown. They just elected John Brown as president. That's what many Southerners felt like. And think about it. Abraham Lincoln. No one even knew who this guy was. Exactly. That's why he grew the beard. And so, with that, what might John Brown do 20 years from now? And then, I said this before in 1856, now a Republican Party can start the South. Lincoln could appoint Republicans to jobs in the South, and next thing you know, within 20 years, a Republican Party there, undermining our whole system, a bunch of John Browns living amongst us. Thus, the Trojan horse idea. So, all of this is not what's happening now, but maybe someday, you never know, this might happen. And so Southerners who pushed for secession, they saw it as, and this is a really key point, it's preventative. And I put down strike, because they all knew they were starting a war. Because they knew, no, it's war. And they didn't see it that way. They claimed it was a just and defensive war because we know someday they're going to get us. Someday. Isn't that kind of scary? Who here can read the future? I want some lottery numbers. I don't have You don't know the future. Can anyone tell the future? Can anyone? All I know for sure is tomorrow I'm almost certain that the sun will come up. And what? I know I'll be coming for Couldn't you say couldn't you say anything you want could happen? 
and then use that to justify any action you want to do. I know someday, someday, that one of you is going to be my boss, mean to me. So it gives me the right to beat you up and take your money. I know someday that bank is going to foreclose on a mortgage on me, so I'm going to rob it today. <laughs> I know someday that country's gonna have nuclear weapons, so I better attack them today. That would never happen. Yeah. Huh? You said you were gonna rob a bank in your life. In my life? We're alive. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know what I'm talking about the old nuclear weapons? Yeah. That's Iraq. In 1914, a country. Oh, I should have one more thing, too. Not only is this preventative war, they're looking at it in 1860. Every day after 1860, the North is going to get stronger. 1870, they'll be stronger. If we don't do it today, what's going to happen? We'll never have another shot. In fact, a lot of people in the South say, say why didn't we do this in 1850? We had a shot during the arguments about the compromise, and we compromised. And now we might lose. In 1870, we will lose. Because someday we're going to do it. We'll be too weak in 1870 to stop them. Huh? Better to leave on the face of Davis, whatever he wrote. Something like that. Better to leave on the face of Davis. Be invited. I mean, I think I invited him. He actually, he sums it up right there. I mean, now it'll be too late. It'll be. Oh, but that's in document three or four. Yeah, three. It'll be too late. At midnight, the day's over. 1914, a country was convinced that the enemies will be too strong and we have to strike now. You know what country that is? Germany. Imperial Germany. And to a lesser degree, Austria, too, though, you're right. And not because of anything that's happened, but because someday we know it. There might be war in the East, so we have to attack France. We're not jumping into World War One, but yeah. Audrey felt the same thing, our enemies will get strong. So, this is a big deal. In fact, I see elements of this right now. It kind of really scares me. North Korea. Someday, they might do something. Trust me, there's a lot of problems in North Korea, but that's really scary when you start saying stuff like that. By definition, a preventative war is a war of aggression. It's a war of aggression. So this was an aggressive act by the South. If I say by definition, in the UN Charter, which the United States signed, which is the equivalent of the treaty, so it's just law, that's what it says in the UN Charter. A preventative war is a war of aggression. Now, I know what you're thinking now. It's not a preemptive war. Let's say you know, North Dakota's about ready to attack us. I mean, North Dakota tanks are on the border. We know they're going to attack. That's a preemptive strike. But not preventative, like someday they might. There's no problem. You can't stop North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been to Bismarck? Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, I was born in Grand Forks. That makes another piece of the puzzle for both of you. Okay, so, it's a big deal. This just an offensive war. So, here they go, and then we have secessionitis. Woo! Like a disease that spread throughout the South. Like tonsillitis or. Yeah, okay. So, I like this one. So, now there's a big fight. Who will be the second state to secede? And so, Mississippi beat them all. Remember, they had the second most slaves. Alabama wanted to be next, but then Florida beat them by one day, so they quit did it. All the deep south. And remember those figures I told you about slavery and cotton production. The biggest cotton producing states and the biggest percentage of slaves all seceded. The upper north. I about said the I about said upper north? The yeah. northern and south. The middle. The middle. These states wavered to see what Lincoln would do. And these border states have slaves, but low percentage. And we'll get to West Virginia in a second. They would end up staying in the Union, but it'd be almost like Civil War in like Baltimore, Kentucky, Missouri was pretty nasty. The Civil War there. And here's the thing you get most Civil Wars, fights between different, or like a like one group inside of a country wants to fight to declare independence and form their own country. You see this after World War I. Usually there's a lot of differences. But think about the similarities between the North and the South. 
Think about it. So put down similarities. Let's get down a few. What are some of the biggest similarities between the North and the South? That is actually a big thing. They both consider themselves Americans. Even after the war began, Southerners still thought of themselves as, as Americans. They're the Confederate States of America. In fact, on that same vein, who were the founding fathers of the North? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, who else? Franklin. Franklin. Adams, who? Alexander Hamilton. Who are the founding fathers of the South? The same people. They have called themselves American and they have the same history. In fact, don't they have the same government? There's a republic. When the Confederate states were created, they created a republic too. It wasn't like the South said, we have to reestablish the King of Georgia. No, they both saw themselves as republic. So we weren't going to put up some established leader or some tyrant had taken over. No, it wasn't like that at all. Even though South kind of said that because of Lincoln taking power. Any more similarities? Some pretty big ones and really basic. Huh? Well, that's fits with Americans. That one. Well, that kind of fits with history. If someone from Vermont or Massachusetts goes down here, can they communicate? Do they use sign language or small signals? So many of the fights are going to be for ethnic groups that want their own independent country. And the big thing that makes them an ethnic group? Language. They have the same language. Well, okay, some from Massachusetts, some are from Georgia. You get them together in the same room, it might appear like they're speaking different languages, but they kind of are English. And what else? One of the biggest causes of civil war will be what? Exactly. And what religion were most northerners and southerners? Protestant Christians. Why did they fight? Also, money. Think about economic system. Sure, more industrial, more rural. But if you got a dollar in New York, could you spend it in Alabama? They had the same basic economic system. Where did the textile mills in the north get their cotton? They're connected. Why did they fight? Slavery is the difference. Slavery is the difference. Of course, we'll become a little difference, but slavery. And it's not so much the system, it's the ideology. And we talk about ideology. The Northerners more and more like, we are the noble free labor system and the South, that positive good theory. And once you have these strongly held beliefs about the different systems, it's really well, it's impossible to waver or to, to make people disagree, to change their opinions. Yeah, there's more industry in the North, but is that a reason to fight? There's slightly better education in the North, is that a reason to fight? The big thing is slavery. And every single article of secession in the South, the reason they seceded would be what? They said it. Slavery. They all knew it. And we don't want what they call black Republicans. So there's President Buchanan. And Buchanan had one issue. He's a Hall of Famer. I like him. I like him. He's still president. Lincoln's elected in November. He doesn't take office till March. He must have had a good time singing Springfield, Illinois, Washington, Springfield, Illinois, watching the country fall apart. I'm sure he's thinking, Lincoln's like, why did I run? Why did I, I really wanted this job? Whoever got second place. Yes. Why did I run and I should start running? Yeah, no kidding. Buchanan would make a statement with this. As states started to secede, he said, states cannot secede. That is unconstitutional. But does anybody want to guess what the next part would be? But they can't no. constitutional power to stop them. Exactly. It's not exactly. Can't stop them. So basically, what does Buchanan said the United States government is going to do as they're being kicked out of the lower south? Nothing. Nothing. He basically spent the rest of his presidency hiding under his desk, a fearful of assassination. I'm only being slightly facetious there. It's true. And so, remember Andrew Jackson? There's nullification. 
and they're talking about this convention in Nashville, and maybe Novine and, and potentially seceding. And Jackson vowed, you know, every single one. He'll hang them all. And Buchanan hit under his desk. So, a key moment. What a five months. Similar thing would happen in 1932. FDR is going to be elected in November. He would not take office until March of 1933, the last president to be inaugurated in March, not January. And in those five months would be the five worst years of the Depression. The country would devolve into anarchy in some places and it would look like civil war. It would just devolve. He, he just, oh, and someone tried to kill him, but that's another story. So, there were a couple of attempts at compromises. John J. Crittenden, Senator from Kentucky, he would propose a Crittenden compromise, it was called. Remember the old 3630 line? Extend it to the sea. But Northerners are free soil. Or, I'm sorry, the Republican Party's free soil and Lincoln's free soil. That proposal would go nowhere. And 3630 would finally die away as some kind of like a magical number. There's also a proposed 13th Amendment that said slavery would be guaranteed forever. But the Republicans are free soil. This sounds like Dred Scott, and they won't do it. Yes, and the that would be too crazy. Actually, you need you need three quarters, but you need two thirds of the House and the Senate to sign by the president. So this was all no. And you can get three quarters. What would the Thirteenth Amendment turn out to be? So it's legal. Yeah. Ironic to make to end slavery with that, isn't it? So compromise. It's too late. By 1861. The South is already preparing, preparing their government in Mobile, Alabama, the Confederate States of America. And they would pick as a provisional president, he'd later be elected in the Republic, Jefferson Davis, Senator, Sec former Secretary of War from Mississippi. Remember, he's the guy who his father in law was Zachary Taylor at Buena Vista and Monterey, his first wife. Mobile was the capital, but they need Virginia. And as soon as Virginia joined, they moved the capital to Richmond. They need Virginia. The most populous state of the Confederates. And King Cotton diplomacy would be the major initiative. This will be one of the most important things that the Confederate states will do. And it's one of the most remarkable things you can imagine. Remember I showed you that graph of exports, so overseas trade? Almost 60% of American trade is cotton. And so what the Confederates thought was, hey, certain countries, what two countries in particular? Britain. Actually, Britain and France. But Britain most by then. They need our cotton. Their textile mills need it. Their economy needs it. That's boycott. <laughs> That's the cotton policy. We will boycott Britain and France. We won't sell them cotton. When their mills shut down, profits drop, unemployment, depression, riot, Britain will do anything to get that cotton, and therefore do what? Not just supply with arms, join with the Royal Navy, who at that time was the most powerful navy in the world, the British Navy. You better see the win. France under Napoleon III, their emperor, they actually wanted to join. Britain had a conundrum. Remember Britain's policy towards slavery? But they also liked the idea of knocking the United States down. They were becoming a, a commercial competitor. Was this a good policy? Disaster. <coughs> One of the dumbest policies ever. Like said, this won't work. And it was worse than they thought. Remember Harper's Ferry? So Britain's watching this one. Wow, they might have civil war. So what did the textile mills, their operators, begin to do? Stop, stockpile cotton. And they also begin to grow cotton in places in India and Egypt. And so in 1861, they didn't really need cotton. And by 1862, everything had changed. The U.S. Navy was relatively small. But what do you suppose happened in that first year of the war? Do you remember the Anaconda Plan? Yeah. What was the big thing about the Anaconda Plan? Well, it was a blockade. Soon, Union ships are cutting off every major harbor. 
no cotton get out. It's too late. By the time they reverse King Cotton diplomacy, it's done. That year, they could have used that cotton to get money to buy weapons, to buy these new, powerful, breech-loading cannons, all this stuff from Britain, and they blew it. That could have been the decisive. The war was razor-thin margin in 1864. A few weapons might have been enough. Terrible. King Cotton Diplomacy. Davis was all for it. Davis would turn out to be a pretty bad president. Everyone thought Lincoln would be the bad one. Oh, we're jumping right here. So let's get to the inauguration. Wouldn't it be awesome? Don't you love the Capitol? They're making the time. No, I, love, I love that picture. Wouldn't it be awesome if the cause part two began right at Lincoln's inauguration? So, find the cause part two, open this up. We're going to do question number 19, the last question of part one, and then we'll start part two. Let us begin. I'm sorry. Let us begin. And I better shut this off because I don't want coffee.